one of our very main speakers of this edition is Mr. Lars Rasmussen. I would want you all to please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Lars Rasmussen has built multiple uh, break, uh, uh, path breaking products uh, globally. He, he was a co-founder of Google Maps. He Last time around when he was in campus, he gave a talk on Google Way for which also he was a co-founder. Um, Mr. Ras, 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 uh, Lars Rasmussen is known for building solutions which impact uh, the next billion. Uh, we, today we would like to hear from him his journey, what inspired him, what motivated him to build solutions for the next uh, billion. With this, uh, I would request uh, IIT Bombay coordinators to please felicitate him. Last to please take over. <coughs> oh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I, I flower. I've never had flowers before. I give a talk. Normally, they wait to see if I do a good job, and then <laughs> sometimes flowers come out. Uh, listen, it's a it's a tremendous pleasure and honor, really, to be invited to speak at TechFest here in Mumbai um, for a, for a number of reasons. It's not my first time. I was thrilled to be invited back, um, but there's a couple of big reasons for this. One is, I think. If you look objectively at the world, there is no question that the center of gravity of the world, economically, technologically, innovation-wise, is shifting incredibly quickly from the West, America and Europe, to the East, India and China. And so I feel like I'm being invited to the future here, not just because you are so much younger than me, and better looking, but because you're in the right place, and not just like in the right place in the world, but also in <coughs> school, of course. Um, I am not an expert on this, but I did work at Google and Facebook, now Meta, for about a decade as an engineering manager in various capacities in um, California, of course, in London, in Sydney, Australia, and everywhere I was very heavily involved in hiring. And back then, at least, Everyone wanted to work at Google and everyone wanted to work at Facebook. And so we got hundreds of thousands of applications. Um, and we tried to make our interviews as difficult as we possibly could so that we would only get the best of the best of the best. And one thing always stood out, which is that when a candidate had a degree from IIT in Bombay, they always passed our interviews. I swear. <laughs> Like no other schools, no, this, even the biggest schools in America didn't have that same statistic. It got so boring that I proposed, we should just stop interviewing people from IIT Monday. We just give them a job offer. And it wasn't just that you know the graduates from are good at interviews, although that's true too. But also like the the the, the success of people that did take our job offers were, were was incredible. So so I'm a little bit envious. You're young. You're the best school in the world, the best place in the world. Um, well done. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Google Maps and what I did after. And uh, we're going to have questions afterwards, right? And so take a little bit of time as you're listening uh, to think about what kind of questions you'd like to answer, ask. I mean, you know, like, like things like, when's the US stock market going to stop crashing? Um, I have no idea, don't ask me that. But you could ask, for example, is it true that brothels, like, like brothels played an important role in the growth of Google Maps in the United Kingdom? Surely that can't be. You could ask questions like that. Or you could ask, you know, what do you think the next big thing is? What did happen to Google Wave, which I talked about when I was here last, failed. Um, uh, what's next? What about crypto? What about the metaverse? Um, borders are controversial. You must have run into fun, say, around Taiwan. You know, questions like that, it's entirely up to you. I am a computer scientist by trade, a programmer, uh, and I tend to be attracted to quite ambitious things. And as a result, 
this is the outcome of most of the projects I worked on. Um, and, and Google Maps, honestly, is, a, is an exception to that. And one that I'm extremely proud of, as you can imagine. So 20 years ago, my brother and I started this project, which is now used by, like, actually a show of hands here. Do you, anyone here use Google Maps? <laughs> That's awesome. And I, you all found this okay. You didn't get, I didn't get you lost anywhere. That's awesome. I lost uh, really the appreciate it. Again, it's a 20-year-old story, so the technology was very different back then. But I'm hoping a few of the lessons that we learned is still useful. And one of the things that stands out to me is that the, the, the economic conditions of the world have some similarities. I don't know if this impacts... India actually, but in the US, the stock market is crashing in a big way, like for a year, it's been down, 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 down. And this is a graph of the NASDAQ. So it's a US stock market index of track technology stock in particular. And you'll see exactly 20 years ago, it was this incredible, it looks small now, but it was really big back then. <coughs> this incredible run up in stock, the dot com bubble, we called it, followed by a devastating crash. So the, the market, the entire market lost 80% of its value across two and a half years. <coughs> Crazy, and that's really where the Google Maps story begins, right there at the, at the red line where I got laid off. And you'll see, if you squint just a little bit, it looks exactly the same now, that there was this massive run up in technology stock during the pandemic, and now it's going down, down, down to about 30% now across a year. I'm not gonna tell you if it's gonna go down to 80 or if it's gonna turn around tomorrow, I have no idea. But what I do know is that people are getting laid off in technology by the tens of thousands, even companies that have never laid off people before, like my former employee Meta, uh, laying off people. And I actually think that if you're into building startups, if you're into doing innovative things that can change the world with a small team, now's a fantastic time to do that, exactly because of this picture. Now, before I get into a story, I have to apologize for my voice. I'm recovering a little bit from a cold, which is not COVID, but um, hopefully it'll last for the hour. So a little bit about myself. I was born in Denmark. It's a very small country in the north of Europe, right above Germany. Um, the entire population of my home country is 5 million people, which I believe is about 20% of just this one city here. It's a very small country. <laughs> Clean, it's well organized, fantastic place to live unless you like sun, which I do. And um, I spent a lot of time in school. I have three degrees from three different universities in three different countries. I did a bachelor's in Aarhus, I did a master's in Scotland, and then I finished up with a PhD in computer science in, in California. And I think by the time I finally graduated, I was like five years older than Einstein when he discovered the theory of relativity. I'm not saying that one is better. Well, actually, I am saying that one is better than the other. But this is, this is my story. So, so now, today, in, in 2022, I live in Athens, in Greece. Uh, my beautiful Greek goddess wife, who is here, is, is from Greece. Um, we moved there last year towards the end of the pandemic. And it's, it's a magic place to live. Quality of life is amazing. And the tech scene there is, is hopping, actually. So, so Greece is one of the less fortunate countries of Europe. And uh, the financial crisis that started a decade ago devastated Greece's economy. And now 10 years later, there's a lot of hardworking people hungry for success. And there's a small but um, very optimistic tech scene there that I'm having a lot of fun uh, being now an investor, an angel investor. We've invested, Ella and I, maybe 60 startups around the world, I was just looking through my uh, portfolio and not a single one of them are in India, which is a, a, a terrible mistake of mine. I hope, uh, I hope we can fix that soon. So back to the story. Uh, 20 years ago, I was still in school. I was finishing my PhD. And um, the dot-com bubble was at the height of things. Like it was so frothy. Everyone was building dot-com tech startups. Um, this is probably before a lot of you were born. Um, but you know about this happening, right? So a lot of academics actually were leaving schools to start companies like Yahoo and Akamai and, and making quite a lot of money. And just before I graduated, the professor down the hall did the same thing, left to start a company. He hired me as I graduated as the first engineer. I brought over my brother from Denmark to work there as well. 
And because of how frothy the days were, so we have really amazing technology, but very little sense of how to turn that into a viable product. Still, we managed to raise 45 million US dollars from venture capitalists in the span of five years, spend all of it, and never really building a product that could sell. That was the way things were. And we were convinced, by the way, that we were going to be rich because everyone else seemed to be coming, becoming rich back then. And then the crash happened. Everything went the other way. Investors stopped investing and we got laid off. In fact, my brother was much smarter than me. He got laid off in one round three months before I got my very predictable pink slip. And when I got laid off, my brother, he called me, actually he sent me a note and he said, last night that you've been laid off, this is what we're gonna work on. And he sent me a note, this is somewhat of a summary, but it wasn't much longer than this. He said, look, I've been thinking about maps online for a while, and I think if we can just make them bigger and faster and prettier, we can do something with this. And so, you all know this, but back then, maps on the <coughs> internet was these um, very static web pages. Like the web back then was really a document browsing tool. And you could go to sites like MapQuest in the US. I don't know if there was an equivalent here in India, but most countries in Europe have one of these, where you'd go and you'd type in an address and you'd see a page full of text, and then there'd be a little map somewhere on the page. And then if you click the button next to the map, the whole page would kind of reload and they would draw another map of a slightly different area. And my brother said, look, we should make the map take up the whole page. We should make it much faster so you can move it around and zoom in and out. And then we should make it prettier. We'd actually both worked as programmers when we were students in the field of graphics design back a long time ago. So we knew a little bit about how to make things pretty on a computer screen. And this is what he said. And he also, of course, had some particular ways to make this happen. And I remember being sold immediately. He claims that it took me days to get it. But I think it was pretty fast. And we set out to work on this thing. And there was this one problem, which was that we were broke. Because remember, we were going to be rich. And so we hadn't exactly saved up money. And now we were without a job and without any money. And so I moved into, I, like, I rented a room in a big house here with a bunch of other people who had just been laid off. And my brother moved back to Denmark. He actually moved back in with my mom, which he hates it when I tell that part of the story. And, um, and we lived on a shoestring budget. We maxed out our credit cards. My brother had this tiny pension that he cashed in at like 30 cents on the dollar. We did some contracting gigs that were paid to just pay for this. And then we started working on my brother's mapping idea. And about six months in, we thought we had a pretty neat prototype. And then we were like, now what do we do? And then we remembered this one guy. Like we talked to a lot of people at this stage and no one thought working on maps was a good idea. But then we remember this one guy, he'd been on the board of the startup that laid us off. And we heard he may still be into investing. Remember the market had just crashed and no one was investing. His name was Frank. And we went to crash a panel discussion, sort of like this, <coughs> we heard we were in. We just kind of like snug in there to talk to Frank to see if he remembered us. And he did remember us. And he offered us time to show the demo and he liked the demo and he's like, I'm gonna help you. And, and Frank is important to us because after all the people said no, so Frank was the first one to say yes. And if we look at all the people we met and got introduced to in the next couple of years that mattered to us, it all forms a graph like that. It's a tree rooted in Frank. And I've seen those many times. I've actually myself been somewhere in these trees uh, after. And so I often encourage entrepreneurs to find your Frank. Find that, that one person who can unlock all the right doors, and that's an important part of the story of starting a company, often, not always. And so we went, oh, sorry, I forgot to change the slide. This is the graph, yeah, so Frank here is the root. He introduced us to someone who introduced us to someone who introduced us to Larry Page, the founder of Google. I'll tell that story in a bit more detail in a second. But the first thing that happened was that Frank saw a demo, he liked it, and he introduced us to maybe 10, maybe 15 VCs in Silicon Valley that we're still like talking to entrepreneurs, but no, it did not sting a lot at this point in time. And we went and we gave our demo and we thought we were hot shit, to be honest, and no one called us back. Like we didn't even get a call to say, hey, look, we're not interested. It was just like deafening silence. And at this point, we worked on this at no salary for six months. We were broke. 
No one was us without pay. And what I really realized, what I'm sure everyone knows who tried this out, that being an entrepreneur is like riding a roller coaster. Ups and downs and ups and downs, well, more like down, 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 up, down, 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 down. It's kind of crazy emotionally. And this you'll see elsewhere in my story as well. And now I would love to tell you that at this stage, we were like my favorite frog here, who facing death does not give up. The truth is that at this point in time, none of the companies in Silicon Valley was hiring. Like no one was hiring, everyone was laying off. And so we thought, ah, we might as well continue. What else are we gonna do? That's really what helped us keep going. And then a few months later, we got a break. A couple of friends of ours in, um, in Sydney, Australia, of all places, they heard about what we were doing and they said, hey, we'll help out. We, don't, we can't find any dogs either, so we'll help out. And we found the cheapest airplane tickets we could get our hands on and we flew down to Sydney, Australia and our friend Noel Gordon let us use his spare bedroom to keep working on our prototype and he introduced us to his friend Steve and Ma. I think Noel is the only of us that are still at Google, but they're fantastic, these smart guys, and they're willing to work for equity since we have no money to pay them with. And we kept working for, oh, I don't know, another six months down in Australia, it's a wonderful place, including Sun. And then we thought, look, we have a much better prototype now. Like if we go back to those VCs and we show them how much better our stuff is now, maybe there's a chance. And so we flew back to, well, I flew back to California. We couldn't afford all of us to fly. I flew back to California and I found Frank and I showed him our prototype and he's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then he introduced us to a new set of VCs. And interestingly, it wasn't the same VCs like I imagine. It was a new set of VCs and actually kind of better and bigger firms. And I think, I think Frank had really been testing us the first time around. Like he wanted to check with the smaller firms if Lars and his brother Jens could not make fools of themselves while pitching a VC. And I guess we passed because now he introduced us to some really big firms. And we did another round of pitches, 10 of them, right? We felt a little bit less like hot shit at this point because we'd been turned down last time. But to a very great and pleasant surprise, one of them, like just one of those 10 called us back. And it happened to be one of the biggest firms in Silicon Valley uh, back then, 20 years ago. They had helped start Google, Yahoo, which is still a big player back then, Apple, and a bunch of, I think actually, so they're still around, they're still top of the world. I think they're actually really active here in India. And they were interested in the sense that they invited us back. They were like, hey, come, should we show it to maybe one of their partners? And they had 12, right? Come back and show it to two more partners. And we did, and they called us back again, come show it to two more partners. And little by little, we got a sense that they were generally interested. And we actually, we made this rule that I think was very important that every time we would go demo again, something new had to be there so that the partner who was sort of hosting the meeting who'd seen it before he got oh that's now so that they could see progress and um and we did that religiously and it seemed to work and at some point um a gentleman I, i'm terrible with name but i, I he was of, of indian origin that's why I, re I remember that being where i forget his name but he um he came into the room i remember specifically he sat on the table and, and he said, look, we're thinking to invest in your company. Maybe two million for 40% of your company, what do you think? And by today's standards, or at least by last year's standards, that's a terrible deal. But in 2002 or whenever this was, we felt like this. And we were trying not to, we were trying not to let that show, but he was one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley. Was, willing to buy 40% of our company for $2 million, and we felt like, have it. And we went and we got a lawyer. So in Silicon Valley, I don't know if this happens here, but in Silicon Valley, there are lawyers willing to work with people like us for no money, but on a contingency, where you only have to pay them if you raise the money. And we found a lawyer like that, and he helped us like figure out the details of the terms we kind of wrote down in a, in a term sheet. and. Um, and uh, he said, look, you only have one VC interested and we have nothing to negotiate with. You should get some more 
people excited about you. And he was like, well, no one else called us back. And he said, look, the secret is this. You should just tell everyone that that big VC is in Arista. And then all <laughs> the other VCs are going to be magically in Arista. And we thought, you know, that sounded compelling, but uh, we thought we'd ask the big VC, are you cool with this? And they said, yeah, look, we're, we're cool with that. It'll work. We are that company. If you spread the, the word, others will want to invest just to be on your cap table with us. But you have to keep in mind that if we don't invest, and Sam promised to invest, right? They had just expressed an interest. If we don't invest and you've told everyone else that we're looking at you, you're going to find that very difficult to explain. You can probably tell where this is going. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're like, okay. We went back to the lawyer. We had him spread the word. He knew all the VCs. The value. And sure enough, suddenly we were talking to a bunch of VCs. And some of them were like coming at us very aggressively, which was awesome. And uh, they were like, we have to invest and you can't let that big guy be your only investor because this terrible thing is going to happen. You've got to let us invest. It was great. Um, I highly recommend doing meetings like this if you can. Good, good for your sense of ego <laughs> in the world. And so we negotiated terms. And we actually, every time we went to do a meeting with big investor, I always ended the meeting by asking, where are we in your funnel? Because you know how this works. It's similar to getting into a school, right? An enormous amount of people apply every year, like thousands of entrepreneurs applied, and they, this company only did like 10 or 12 investments back then, much more now. And, and, and they keep track of this funnel, right? How it works. And every meeting we asked, and they always knew exactly the answer. And at some point we asked them, so if we sign this term sheet, which you know is a non-binding agreement that outlines at a high level the terms, where are we then in your funnel? And at that point, they said, you're at 70%, right? So you've gone from like a tenth of a percent to 70%, but you're not at 100% yet. And it surprised me a little that three out of 10 companies, this kind of all changed by now, but three out of 10 companies that signed the term sheet with this particular investor did not actually get the investment. And the, the reason they explain is one of two things can happen. One is that we go ask all our existing portfolio companies if they're working in this space. And if they are, we often don't invest. <coughs> we don't want to have competing companies in our portfolio, but we also don't like it if that startup's window is about to close because a bigger player is in that space. And uh, the, other, the other thing that can happen is that the entrepreneur might have misrepresented something that comes out during due diligence, and then we kick them right out and never talk to them again, which was not going to happen, of course. But so we, we, we said, okay, fine, let's do this. We scheduled a time to uh, sign the term sheet, a morning, I remember. And the day before, Yahoo who was still a big player back then, had one of the most popular map sites in the US, launched a tiny, tiny little change to the map site, which they hadn't touched for years, the day before we were going to sign the term sheet. And the next morning, I got a call from the investor who said, Lars, we got to talk. If you ever have to make a call with me, don't start it like that because I have bad memories. Because the deal was off. They had seen this thing happening. And remember, Yahoo was a portfolio company of this investor. And so they basically changed their mind for exactly the reason they have predicted, right? That one of their portfolio companies was rumbling in our space and they just didn't want to invest under those conditions, right? And then what happened next? was exactly what they had predicted, that all the other companies that had come out of so aggressively also changed their mind, swearing that it had nothing to do with the big investor's decision. But it was basically over. And um, you can imagine the feeling was a bit like this. Uh, actually, um, <laughs> much worse than this. I can't begin to describe how painful this was, right? because we were so almost there. And uh, I think I called my mom crying, literally. <laughs> and explain this thing now. <coughs> she said, she said, son, it happened because there's something better waiting for you out there. She's a great mom. Uh, I, hope, I hope your mom's like that. You know, I didn't make me stop crying. So we cried and, you know, we felt like shit for about three days. But, but by then, I do think we had developed a little bit of this sort of stamina here, right? That by now we had gotten so close, we had gotten this massive investor in Arista, they almost invested if there is such a thing. We must be onto something, there must be something we can do. 
And so once we got on top of ourselves, took like three days, we called the three people that had been the most bullish about what we did. So Frank, of course, who had some advice that didn't turn out to be so interesting. We called a partner at the investor who had shepherded us through all these meetings. And he said, look, I can probably find you half a million dollars. Heck, I'll do it myself. And then, you know, see where that'll take you. But honestly, I don't think, I don't think you should take it. It's not a good idea. And then, um, then we call this handsome fellow here, uh, who happens to be born in India, but uh, lives in the U.S. now. And um, he <coughs> was kind of working. He wasn't one of the partners at the end of the <coughs> But he worked on this side of them. And he was going to be on our board, invest a bit of money personally, and help us out. He's a business guy. He's going to help us out because we were all engineers, so, and he was going to be our business guy. And we just showed him the demo, and he seemed to really like it. And um, we called him up, and we explained what had happened. And he said, look, I can't work with you if the investor is not going to invest because they were the ones making the introduction. This is not how it works. But then he gave us some advice, probably the most impactful advice in my life. He said, look, if you think about it, the very reason the investor doesn't want to invest, namely that Yahoo is rumbling in the mapping space, is going to make Google want to buy you. So Google was young, but growing really quickly. This was right before their IPO. And Google had nothing in mapping, and Yahoo was their big competitor back then. And here was a chance, argued Ron, for Google to buy you and then leapfrog. Yahoo in the mapping space. And Google loves leapfrogging, Ram said. And Ram conveniently was on the board of Google and knew Larry and Sergey personally. And remember, this is all back to Frank, but he's a very good guy to know. And within um, a few days, we were meeting with Larry Page at the Google campus in California. And we showed him our maps. And Larry is a, he's a, a man of few words um, and also few facial expressions. Um, and we were, you know, nervous because this was really our last chance. And we, it was hard to read him. And in the end, he said, well, I should back up a little bit. So you're all technical people. And so I can share just a little bit of, of, um, of technical background here. So, so we're back in the early days of the web when the web was just starting to become an applications platform. Hadn't really happened yet. And one of our founding principles in my little startup was that the reasons maps are so shitty on the internet is that web browsers just don't have the power to give a, a good dynamic mapping experience. And so we had actually built a separate application that you would download and install on your computer. This is long before iPhones and Android and all these things. And and, and so our pitch was, you would download this application, all of your mapping things would happen in a separate application <laughs> distinct from your web browser. And so if you wanted to find the good pizza places or where the cinemas are, where they're showing the new uh, Avatar movie, you'd go on your maps browser and you'd search for it there because location was important. And Larry's thing was, look, I like the way you think about maps, but Google is really a web company. Are you sure? that you can't do this in a web browser. And we said, yeah, no, that can't be done. That's not possible. And he said, okay. And so he kind of walked out the door <laughs> and, he, and he introduced us to some business people. He's like, you guys handle this. And then, and then we went back home and we were now in what I like to call a heightened state of motivation. Broke, desperate, completely without chances. No one would talk to us. There was really only Larry in the whole world who could turn this into something. And, and in the next three weeks, by far, by far the most productive of my life, we disproved the very theory that our entire startup was kind of founded on. And we rebuilt our mapping client working day and night in a web browser. Uh, because it turns out to be just possible back then. If you're willing to like go, so this was back when Internet Explorer was still king. And they had built some weird non-standards compliant things that they call dynamic html with javascript and and weird stuff and um and we learned about this and it turned out you could actually build a dynamic mapping application in the browser without having to install any software <coughs> and firefox was in in version 0 0.8 back then they had taken the approach that 
you know, forget standards. Internet Explorer is a standard. So we're going to build everything you can do in Internet Explorer. And so we couldn't quite make it work in Firefox back then, but it was clear that they were going in that direction. And so we just built it for Internet Explorer. We went back three weeks later to Google, and we were like, you mean something like this maybe? Was this what you had in mind? And then we, um, okay. so we had just blown our own minds, and we're hoping to blow Google's minds. And we did at least enough that they then right there decided we're going to mine them. And uh, which is awesome. Um, you can see the shape of this roller coaster, right? I should have another picture of now flying even higher in the, <laughs> at the level of the moon. But um, but that's that's what happened. And and they did buy us. And um, it took. I'm just checking the time here. Um, it took a good long time for them to buy us. And every day, like it took them six months. And and every day I was waiting for that phone call. Bars, right? so we got to talk. You know, we changed our mind. Sorry. Um, but that phone call never called. Actually, another fun phone call came, which was um, uh, from the head of of their corporate development team that buys startups. Um, she she's like, look, look, guys, I can't. You gotta come work here on Monday. Like we don't have time to build buy your company, but you gotta come work. You got we're gonna give you jobs. And you're starting on Monday. Come and. <laughs> And, uh, and we, we thought about it. And so there were lots of rumors at the time that Google was about to go public. And so we were guessing, all right, they're about to announce they're going to go public and they want to hire us before they go public so that our stock options, you know, have a better strike price. You know, that's how we, how, and then we went back to our lawyer and we're like, should we do this? And the lawyer said, hold on, are you crazy? You can't go and take jobs there because then what if they don't buy your company? Like all of your IP is gonna like, you know, filter into, and you're no, absolutely not. You don't do it. And so we ignored our lawyer, which turned out to work out really well. We got the jobs. Google went public and made a huge difference because the compensation when they finally bought our company was in part some stocks for our company, but it was also really nice jobs with good stock options, and those became worth a lot more because of that little. Thing. So Google, Google is great. And actually, it was a little, when they then bought us six months later, I mean, the reason it took so long was that all their business people were busy with their multi-billion dollar going public, <laughs> which was a little bit more important than buying this four-person outfit. And, um, and, and when it came to them buying, there were some things we hadn't quite worked out, where you could interpret things one way or the other, and Google kind of very carefully interpreted it in our favor to make sure it didn't look like they were taking advantage of this error fantastic company to deal with. And um, and actually, even when Google Maps then turned into it, right? So, so Google <laughs> Google Maps internally in Google is very famously by far, by far, by far the best return of investment of any acquisition they ever did. By which I mean they paid very little for us. Um, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, good for them. But uh, but when, when it, because you can imagine our negotiating position, right? Hey, do we, this is largely ends and no one wants to invest in us and we don't have any other options and you, do you want to buy us? And, and they're like, sure, for, you know, a very small amount of money based on, uh, on what you might think of what other mapping acquisitions have happened before and after. It worked out very well for us. It was great. Um, Google was fantastic. They actually, like, once it took off, they were a little embarrassed by how cheaply they bought us. So they, they gave us a, a few more shares, which is great. Um, but now, you know, Google Maps looks like this. And so this whole roller coaster ride was tremendously worthwhile. Um, billions of people use it, including uh, you wonderful folks. And, and I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of this. And if you're considering at all computer science, uh, I think it's one of the one of the fields where you have the highest chance of making this kind of impact on the world, starting out with a small team with very few resources still today. So <laughs> do consider it. Um, although there are times when I'm envious that I didn't study. I, one of the hostesses is studying me metallurgy, and, uh, and and I think uh, or mechanical engineering, and like people building actual like real things in the world. Uh, there are days when I'm honestly envious, and when I look at what to invest in now. I try to, to invest in things that are based on non-computer science insights into the world so that I can uh, learn a little. Um, now, uh, <coughs> I'll take a little break for this. I, I, the <coughs> part of the story here is one of my favorite parts, where, um, which is about how Google Maps came about in India in particular, because that, that, that's a separate story. Um, and the heroes happen to be graduates of your amazing school. Um, and the villain happens to be me, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is always fun. Hang on. 
So th this is Google Maps today. Um, covers the whole world. As you can see it's big, it's fast, it's pretty, just like my brother wanted. But it wasn't the way it looked um, back when we started. This is our look back when we started. So we only have maps of uh, America. And uh, no one really grogged the idea of having this one search field for a map. Everyone had, you know, like a thousand search fields where you can click in streets here and zip code here and whatever. And so, and so we, we launched like this and we encouraged people to try it out by searching for pizza, by the way, a, a fun little story here. And so a lot of people went and looked at the entire US and searched for pizza. And if you do that today, we'll show you some really good pizza places. Back then, we had no idea where, <laughs> where the good pizza places were. And so we showed you uh, the place that was right in the center of this map every time. And we encouraged people to do this as their first test. And so very soon after, we got this glowing email from this completely random pizza place in the middle of America, who just like loved us, like loved us to death because they are busy and just like went through the road. <laughs> but uh, so, so this was Google Maps when we launched it. Um, and you can see it's only, actually I think we included Canada back then. And so shortly after, you know, the easiest second country, of course, was the United Kingdom because they conveniently speak the same language. And then we made the map look like this. Um, which we're <laughs> very proud of this. Uh, you, you'll notice that the UK is placed in exactly the right relative location to the United States. Um, and then we made a lot of blue, which we thought of as a promise of we're going to you know, map the world here. Um, and we got, we got a lot of emails back then, mostly about mundane things. But when we launched this, we got this great email from a user in like all caps, you forgot Poland, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so this is how I looked for, for a while. And then, then we got this email from, uh, from Bangalore. So Google had an office in Bangalore, amazing people working there. And, um, and th these two guys here, uh, Ludit and Sanjay, who are IIT Bombay graduates, incredibly talented, they wrote to us saying, hey, this Google Maps thing you launched is really cool. We want this for India. Can you write us a playbook? How do we make this happen in India as well? And we wrote them, a, we were very excited about this. We wrote them a playbook. We're like, step number one is you go find a provider of digital maps database. So back then, Google did not yet make their own maps database. We'd license it from companies that made car navigation systems. And we said, go find a company like that in India and then do this, 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 and you'll have Google Maps India. And uh, shortly after, they wrote us back saying, well, so hey, step number one, there is no one providing a digital mapping database of India. But, and then we got this incredibly optimistic view of the world, which by the way, I've come to believe very firmly that if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to suffer from what I call pathological optimism. It's like a necessary ingredient. You're not guaranteed success, but I've never seen anyone been successful without pathological optimism. Um, and, and these guys were like, but we're gonna build one and we're gonna build it in a Wikipedia style. We're gonna just take what you built and on top of it, we're gonna make a maps editor and then everyone in India is gonna go and build that digital mapping database that's missing. And they, have, they had thought about it, they're like on every street corner in India, this is 20 years ago, every street corner in India, you can buy paper maps. Indians really like maps and everyone's gonna go buy that map and they're gonna input that data and it's gonna be awesome. And we thought that is gonna be awesome. And so we said, absolutely, go for it. How can we help? And then they set out to build this in Bangalore. And we continued working on Google Maps and we were trying to you know, cover the developed world first and so on. And, um, and then uh, a bit of tension started developing between my team and the team in Bangalore. Because remember, they were trying to build stuff on top of Google Maps, which is just launched. And it was super immature and full of chewing gum and safety pins and, and duct tape. Um, and so it was hard to build on top of, and we were keep changing it and they kept breaking our build and everything got very tense and they didn't seem to produce something that actually worked for quite a long time. Like for a couple of years, it was just this annoying thing um, uh, out of India by these super optimistic uh, <coughs> guys and it was, it was annoying. And you know, I went to my, I remember I mentioned I'm the villain of the story here. And so I went to my boss in California. I'm like, this is really annoying. And, um, and he said, well, go to Bangalore and meet with them and, and tell me, you know, he, he said, you should either shut it down or figure out how to help them to make this work. And so when, and we talked, we had a great time. 
but I just couldn't see how they were going to make this happen because they were so full of optimism and seemed to have no, I mean, this is a, a, probably a cultural thing. Like they, they didn't seem to understand why it wasn't working. Um, and so I just came away, I said, you gotta, you gotta stop, guys. It's a great idea, I love you, you gotta stop, like stop. <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, okay. And then we went to see, there's this great town in the Bangalore where they make amazing silk, and we went to do that tourist thing, and we came back and we said bye. And then the guy, I, I'm sorry, I forget his name, uh, also Indian, um, who ran the office, like the site director in Bangalore, he pulled me aside as I'm leaving with my suitcase, and he's like, so Lars, guys are pumped. And what if, what if I promise you, you will never even notice that we keep working on this thing, even though you told us to stop. I'm like, you know, we'll figure a way to make it so that you, your build will never break, we'll never ask for help, but we'll just keep working on it. Right? And I'm thinking in my head, this is going to happen no matter what I say, <laughs> which is great, because um, I wasn't their boss anyway, not that that would have made a difference, I'm sure, but the, but the, I'm like, What's there to lose? So I said, sure, sounds great, go for it. Don't tell me, but don't pretend you never said this. You know, I've done my, my big bad boss. <laughs> and so, and so I, went, I went home and didn't think any more about it. Uh, and then like a year later, this crazy thing launched. I'm getting goosebumps now. I don't know if you guys are getting goosebumps, but this is an incredible thing. So this is called Google Maps Maker, which no one in, in the part of the world I live in even knows that this, this happened <coughs> that they launched. Um, uh, a map maker exactly like they predicted, a Wikipedia style thing for maps. And people all over India like flooded the site. And actually not just in India, but in the, in the next few years, 160 countries around the world got Google Maps because of what these guys did. I reached out to both of them, they're, they're both doing super exciting things here in India. I reached out to both of them, they, they couldn't make it today, but I'll tell you a lot of them. This is an, an amazing, amazing thing. Um, and I'm so glad, I, you know, I, I have never been happier being so completely wrong about anything in my life. And even today, you know, now Google Maps is, makes its own maps around the world. We no longer license anyone else's maps, I think, and a lot of them are coming from this. It doesn't exist in this form anymore. It exists in different forms, but it all started with what Sanjay. And <coughs> like that. All right, so we have a little bit more time. Um, um, surprisingly, I always run out of time before telling you a story because it still hurts. Um, but, but after we did Google Maps, my brother and I had an enormous amount of self-confidence, as you can imagine. And Google had a lot of confidence in us too. And so my brother had this new idea for how we were gonna change like, the base layer of communication on the internet, which still today is email. Like, it's like the only thing you can rely on everyone in the world having is email, even though that's now you know, 50, 60 year old technology. And so backwards compared to more modern tools, um, like messaging apps, for example, right? And, and my brother was like, we've got to build something better that everyone can have that's open. And so he came up with this idea, um, Google Wave, and Google threw resources at us. Like they invested $25 million in this project, gave us 60 of the best of the best of the best engineers they had, and we worked on it for years. And, and we, we, we showed a demo um, of this thing where people got really excited. Like I did a demo in front of like 5,000 people at a big conference, <laughs> geeks, right? And, and they all stood up and applauded, which is very difficult for a geek to do. And they, you know, we, we thought we were, and this disappeared. This is CNN that described us as geniuses and even found a baby picture of us and so on. But um, to cut a long story short, um, <laughs> it was one of these things, it, it just totally failed. And it's a, you know, I don't have time to explain what happened, but um, it really hurt actually when, when this happened. But it's, it's an interesting thing to look back and see that now 10 years after we turned into a shipwreck, um, actually some good things have come out of it. Um, not quite what we expected, but we can see a lot of the ideas that we had here have made it into actually viable products. Uh, like Google Docs or some of the messaging apps out there and, and so on, which is, you, you know, a, a quiet little victory. But more importantly for us, just from a, a completely selfish point of view, a lot of the people that we recruited for that team, 
which is the best team I've ever worked with. It's amazing I still managed to screw it up. But a lot of them have gone to start other companies and have very kindly allowed uh, LME to invest. <coughs> Um, and one of them actually, do you guys know this company? Yeah. 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 So, so, so they started right as Wave died. And I got introduced to the two founders, a young couple, from a small mining town in, in Australia. And um, this guy wanted to invest. He's like, these guys have something, but they don't have a tech team. They were, it was like a graphics designer and a business student wanted to build this thing and, and my, one of my favorite investors said, Lars, recruit these guys like a world-class tech team that you vouch for and then I'll invest. And here was this huge wave team who had just been like canceled by Google and um, I managed to, it took about a year, I managed to help Mel and Cliff, the founders here, recruit Cam Adams who became their third co-founder. So he's, he's a very rare breed that he's actually a UI designer. But he's also a very skilled programmer, which is difficult to find the, the company. He's you know, like a published programmer of user interfaces. And so he was perfect for this job. He's a co-founder. And then we, we hired um, Dave Herndon out of my team too. So I was past my non-solicitation agreement, I should just clarify. But we hired Dave Herndon to, uh, to join. He's now the, the CTO of, um, of Canva. And actually, a fun little story is that it took us a long time to, because these Mel and Cliff hadn't even started yet, hadn't raised my hand, nothing. It was more like if you join us, these guys will invest and then we'll change the world. And Herndon, who was still working at Google, he eventually agreed, I'm going to do this. And then he went to tell Google in, in Australia, I'm going to go join this startup that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> and Google said, um, no, you're not. <laughs> and they quintupled his compensation overnight. 5x in cash and stock. We want you to stay. Um, and then I got that call. You know, the top right. It wasn't quite as devastating, but it was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. He was like disappointed. I can't say no to all this money. I just can't, I just can't say no. I'm out. <laughs> and then Melanie, who was now the CEO of this, I think it's $40 billion company, um, she wrote a fairy tale about Dave. A graphics novel fairy tale, which is graphics, <coughs> and it was all about his journey in life and his desires and wishes to work for an exciting startup and the big bad Google who wouldn't let him go and Lars who was like, no, you should go. And it was it, just a, they published their story now. I'm not sharing anything secret. And he he called me back laughing his head off and said, okay, fine, I'll join. And you know he's a, yeah, a, a, I think a, a billionaire now, which is good for him. But more importantly, he's like helped change the world. They're like 110 million active users, it's, it's an incredible, incredible story. And there are other startups now that are just getting off the ground by people from the same team. Um, you'll hear it here first. You'll see when, when you invite me back in 10 years, like, I'll talk about those startups as being <coughs> successes. But there's a company called Tana in Norway, of all places, that are inventing a whole new way of taking notes, which is amazing. A uh, company in, um, also in Australia called Nura that make digital twins for power utilities. So like if you happen to be a power utility and you want a good modern software tool to design your power lines, that's your guy. And then Neptime in uh, New York that do spreadsheets that you can program really well, but that also kind of program themselves with AI. You should check it out because they <coughs> published their demos that time. <coughs> so there, that's my story. Um, I think we're 45 minutes in. That's all I have. Thank you.